Hey everyone, welcome back to Dietitians and Nutrition Support. As our research and clinical practices continue to develop, we also see developments and changes in products. An area that we've seen a lot of different changes in in the past few years has been lipids. So we're talking about injectable lipid emulsions, which you might consider lipids that would be in parenteral nutrition. To give you a lowdown on what kinds of lipid products might be on the market and some of their best uses for things such as hypertriglyceridemia or critical illness, we have Leah Gramlich. She's a physician up in Canada who is very familiar with all the different things we have going on with lipids, and she's going to talk you through a few tips that you might need to know as you start to maybe adapt or change some of the various lipids that you use with your patients. My name is Leah Gramlich, and I'm a gastroenterologist and professor of medicine at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I am a physician nutrition specialist, and I also work as the provincial medical advisor for nutrition services. And as such, I am the dyad partner of my nutrition service colleague, Carlotta Baswaldo Hammond, and we together manage over 500 dietitians in acute care and in community. I do a lot of TPN practice uh, and run nutrition support teams at two large metropolitan hospitals and I'm very comfortable with this topic. So it's a pleasure to be here uh, today to share with you some clinical pearls and practice considerations with respect to the use of intravenous lipid emulsions. There are numerous health benefits of intravenous lipid emulsions, which were really developed in the early 1960s. These fluids are high energy density. 20% lipid emulsions typically provide two cals per mil. And with this, we can meet energy requirements with lower volume, and volume overload is often a consideration that we need to address in our patients who require parenteral nutrition. In addition, using parenteral lipids obviates the needs for excessive dextrose, reducing hyperglycemia. Think about the critically ill patient who's insulin resistant, who you can't get glycemic control even though you've got an insulin drip running at a very high rate. Intravenous lipids are low in osmolality, and therefore, if we're using them as part of peripheral parenteral nutrition, they can aid in prevention of thrombophlebitis. And two other key aspects of intravenous lipid emulsions are that they enhance bioavailability of the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, and they're a source of essential fatty acids, uh, uh, linoleic and linolenic acid. So... The use of lipid emulsions has evolved over the past two decades since their first creation in the 1960s. In the first generation, lipid emulsions were really soy-based and included intralipid. Second generation, lipid emulsions, including soy and MCT, an example of which is lipofundin, were developed shortly thereafter, but do not have a lot of use. Third generation uh, lipid emulsions include soy-based soy uh, lipids as well as an olive oil-based lipid. And clinoleic is the exemplar of this lipid emulsion. And fourth generation lipid emulsions include fish oil. And two examples are SMOF uh, and omega -Vin. These uh, lipid emulsions are demonstrated in this uh, chart here. In this chart, you can see that Intralipid, which is a pure soy-based lipid emulsion, is very high in essential fatty acids, linoleic and alpha-linolenic acid, but it's also high in phytosterols, which can contribute to intestinal failure-associated liver disease. Phytosterols are also more prevalent in 10% lipid emulsions uh, that we might be using for propofol and can contribute to uh, complications. Clinoleic contains soy oil as well as olive oil. Because it contains soy oil, you meet your requirements for essential fatty acids, and it's got uh, uh, um, a favorable uh, composition of alpha-tocopherol alpha and uh, a favorable ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. SMOF lipid includes soy, me medium-chain triglycerides, olive oil, and fish oil. This dose of fish oil is quite low. It's not a therapeutic dose, but it is potentially anti-inflammatory. And omegavin is all fish oil. And you can see that it's relatively limited in these essential fatty acids, linoleic and alpha-linolenic acid. Uh, intralipid uh, results in the generation of high levels of omega-6 fatty acids and is potentially 
uh, pro-inflammatory. Clinolaic is an immunoneutral uh, lipid because of its olive oil. Smoff lipid with fish oil contains anti-inflammatory uh, effects. And omegavin is almost universally used for rescue of IAP-associated liver disease. Let's talk about hypertriglyceridemia. It's a common condition that you'll see in hospital in patients who have critical illness due to stress hormone release or cytokine release. And it's also seen in the setting of overfeeding of dextrose. The mechanism by which hypertriglyceridemia develops uh, relates in part to impaired lipid clearance because of decreased function of lipoprotein lipase. The consequences of uh, hypertriglyceridemia include an impaired immune response, altered pulmonary gas exchange, as well as acute pancreatitis. Now, pay in mind, uh, keep in mind the fact that acute pancreatitis is not seen with mild elevations of triglycerides, but really severe elevations of triglycerides above 11 millimoles per liter, 1,000 milligrams per deciliter. However, serum triglyceride levels of over 4.5 millimoles per liter are associated with risk of adverse events. So what do you do if you have a patient who needs parenteral nutrition uh, and who has hypertriglyceridemia? Well, before you start PN, you want to assess the baseline labs. As you think about writing your PM prescription, you want to ensure that your dextrose delivery is less than four milligrams per kilogram per minute. And you want to make sure that your lipid dose is less than 30% of total energy or being provided at less than one gram per kilo per day. So in the 70 kilo individual, 70 grams of lipid or less. We always have to pay attention to lipids used as a drug delivery vehicle. So specifically, 10% lipid emulsions, usually using, usually using soy-based lipid emulsions, may be used for propofol administration. And if it is used for uh, propofol or other drug administrations, it's very possible that maximal doses of intravenous lipid effusion rates are exceeded. Uh, in patients with hypertriglyceridemia, the other consideration you need to keep in mind is using a soy-based alternative. So clinolaic or small lipid might be considered. Let's switch gears a little and talk about other uh, issues that you might uh, address by changing your intravenous lipid emulsion. Intestinal failure associated liver disease uh, is uh, defined as liver injury as a result or one or more factors related to intestinal failure. Now intestinal failure associated with liver disease is typically seen in type 3 intestinal failure, which is chronic intestinal failure, usually requiring home TPN. And it's uncommon in type 2 intestinal failure, which is essentially prolonged hospital-based intestinal failure. In these patients who are in hospital, your surgical disaster with GI tract not in continuity or with multiple enterocutaneous fistulas or ongoing intra-abdominal sepsis, in these people, they may develop abnormal liver function tests. And you may be wondering whether or not they have intestinal failure associated liver disease. In these patients, it's really important to rule out other causes of the liver disease, such as intra-abdominal sepsis, underlying hepatobiliary disease like cholelithiasis, medications that may cause abnormal liver function tests, or ruling out a history of underlying liver disease like hepatitis B or hepatitis C. There are typically three patterns of intestinal failure associated liver disease. Uh, steatohepatitis can be seen. You can have cholestasis or you can have underlying gallbladder sludge and stones. And these are exacerbated in the setting of a non-fed GI tract. Risk factors for IF associated liver disease include overfeeding of carbohydrate or lipid, Lipids that have a high omega-6 fatty acid composition, such as soy-based lipid emulsions. The protein composition, particularly in neonates, may be playing a role in the development of intestinal failure associated liver disease. And the total amount of parenteral nutrition relative to overall nutrients, such as oral or enteral nutrition, is relevant. Particularly, the absence of any oral or enteral feeding increases the risk of developing IF-associated liver disease.
So how do we treat IF-associated liver disease or steatohepatitis or hepatobiliary disease related to uh, IF uh, or to TPN use? The cornerstone of this therapy is to avoid soy-based lipid emulsions. It's felt that the predominance of omega-6 fatty acids and their pro-inflammatory cytokines that they generate may contribute to the development of IF-associated liver disease. Omegavin is an intravenous lipid emulsion that's made of 100% omega-3 fatty acids or fish oil. And in pediatric patients uh, shown in both uh, randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses, omegavin has been shown to reverse liver injury. Its role in adults has uh, not been as clearly elucidated. Omegavin works by reducing cholestasis. Uh, we do not see the same impact of alternate lipids such as SMOF or clinoleic or lipofundin in the reversal of uh, PN cholestasis, but we similarly see that SMOF, clinoleic, and lipofundin over time have the same potential for risk in terms of uh, the propensity for developing PN cholestasis or IF-associated liver disease. What about intravenous lipid emulsions in critical illness? The hypothesis is, is that pro-inflammatory omega-6 soy-based lipid emulsions with high levels of alpha tocopherol may worsen inflammation and immunosuppression. As such, we have two different guidelines from uh, a organizations that create guidelines such as the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition or the uh, European Society for Nutrition and Metabolism. At Aspen, their recommendation is such that lipids be withheld for the first week following PN initiation. Now, this is a consensus definition and only 64% of the participants in this consensus definition actually voted for this. We need to be conscientious of the patient who's at very high nutrition risk, who may also have hyperglycemia and be aware of the fact that novel lipid emulsions with relatively low omega-6 load may allow an energy provision with low osmolality without the consequence of uh, fat that we're seeing with omega-6 fatty acids. The European Society for Nutrition and Metabolism, or ESPEN's recommendation favors the use of novel intravenous lipid emulsions to reduce the omega-6 fatty acid load. And they suggest consider using um, a fish oil-based lipid emulsion to reduce inflammation, uh, as is evidenced in measurement of reduced length of stay and reduction in requirement for mechanical ventilation, and olive oil-based lipid emulsions such as clinoleic, which is immunoneutral, has been demonstrated to reduce the uh, requirement for mechanical ventilation. So in critical illness, iterate towards using a non-soy-based lipid emulsion, consider withholding for the first week, or using an alternate one. What about intravenous lipid emulsions in food allergies? Allergic reactions to parenteral nutrition are uncommon and they're seen in less than one out of 100 patients. The usual culprit is the lipid emulsion, which causes the trouble 48% of the time. Although multivitamins are associated with allergy to parenteral nutrition a third of the time and the amino acid solution is the causal agent 10% of the time. 60% of the symptoms occur at the initiation of feeding, but there is a range of time. And the range of symptoms can vary from rash all the way to anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis associated with hemodynamic instability. In general, there's a few principles that we can adopt when you're trying to feed parenteral nutrition to a patient with a history of food allergy. In patients who have soy and egg allergies, avoid soybean uh, lipid emulsions. There is also cross-reactivity with the allergens. Olive oil and fish oil-based lipid emulsion should be avoided in patients with olive and fish allergy, and it's possible to use a risk stratification approach, as is evidenced in this next slide. For instance, in a patient with a history of hypersensitivity to lipid emulsions or food, with no risk, you would not do anything, or if low risk, you would look at ingredients Conversely, in a patient with a high risk of uh, 
reaction to intravenous lipid emulsion or food sensitivities or moderate risk, you would consider using a lipid emulsion with a component that is not an allergen in that individual. In addition, you can discuss the risks and benefits of trying out the lipid emulsion, desensitizing them, and also watching them very closely. What about dosing considerations for intravenous lipid emulsions? Certainly in neonates who have a higher uh, energy requirement per kilo than do adults, the maximal daily dose is about 2.5 grams per kilo per day, uh, but certainly we wouldn't go above 60% of energy as a lipid emulsion. A practical dose, as I mentioned, and a safe dose is a gram per kilo per day. And the rate of infusion shouldn't exceed 0.11 grams per kilogram per hour to reduce hyperlipidemia, infection, and fat overload syndrome. When the intravenous lipid emulsion is delivered separately from the amino acid dextrose, uh, suggested 12-hour hang time with changing of tubing every 24 hours is recommended. And it's also suggested that uh, an inline filter be used. I do a lot of talks about intravenous lipid emulsions across the country, and I recognize that dietitians may or may not have a choice as to what lipid emulsion they have access to. The lipid emulsion is often purchased through pharmacy, and dietitians may or may not be able to weigh in on that. The goal is to see collaboration between nutrition services and pharmacy to ensure that there are a wide variety of intravenous lipid emulsions available. If access uh, to a novel lipid emulsion is not available, we have to work with what we have. Uh, I have a patient on home TPN who's been on home TPN for over 30 years, and he has received soy-based lipid emulsions, providing a significant amount of his energy over his lifetime, given that TPN meets 90% of his needs. So if you do need to use soy-based lipid emulsions because that's all you have access to, be cognizant of the fact that 10% lipid emulsions have more emulsifiers and are potentially more toxic, uh, and that we should be limiting dosing, and we should be looking for consequences of IV lipid emulsions and looking for enteral therapy to address this. Thank you. Mm -hmm.